So uh, when, I were, when, I was, when I was a kid, when I was, when I was a youngster, there were, there were three words that would get my heart pumping. I mean, it would just get my, my blood uh, uh, going in a, in a heartbeat. Uh, let's go fishing. All right, how many of you like to fish? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, man, I loved, I loved, loved fishing as a kid. I went all the time. We lived, we lived uh, over by Clear Lake uh, during my elementary school years. So, so uh, uh, during those years, I mean, they were, man, if we got bored, Buddy and Scott and mine, we'd run down to the lake and, and fish. We always had poles near us. You know, I'd grab them out of the, the garage and get on our bikes, and we'd ride our bikes down to the lake, and we'd fish. And my dad, if he got bored, he'd say, come on, let's go fishing, and we'd grab the fishing poles. and we'd go. I mean, we'd have tons of, of memories, great memories, fishing uh, in, in my elementary school years. Uh, we're fishing all the time. Something strange happened, though, about the time I got to high school. I, I mean, uh, and it isn't true for everybody. It's just had what happened in, in, in my life. I just kind of stopped. I mean, it's something I love doing. I just kind of kind of stopped. Now, now, I was busy, you know. Uh, we didn't live near the lake anymore. We moved back to Des Moines area. I was born, and raised, or born here, then moved there for a while, came back. So we weren't really, it, was, it was more work to go fishing. Had to think about it more. Maybe that was it. Uh, I was in school, and, and, and the, you know, the homework gets a little more challenging. When you get into high school, taking more difficult classes. Uh, there was football practice in the fall, usually summer practices too. Uh, track in the spring. Uh, that kept me busy. Uh, I had a, had a job at Burger King, and if I was going to pay for my cool car, you know, I had to have work, right? So, so I, I had to work as many hours as possible to, to make money. And then I had this girlfriend, and, and she didn't really like it. Fish. The fish was kind of gross to her. And, and, and it was like, well, I, you know, if I had to choose between fish and her, it's like, well, it was her, you know? So, so we found other things to do, and that kind of got me through my high school years. And then I, I got to college, and it was kind of the same thing. I, I, I was... Uh, in college now, so now you're doing, you know, college-level courses and college-level homework, and, and I had a job that kept me working through, through college, and, and then at 20, I started preaching, so pretty young guy, I'm, I'm preaching, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the church work plus the factory job plus college, and I have another new girlfriend now who also doesn't like the fish, uh, and, and, and so again, it's like, well, we found other things to do, and, and it just, I just, Stop fishing. Just, just, just stop doing it. It doesn't take long for months to become years and years to become decades. And then you look back and think, man, there's a lot of things you could call me. Fisherman's not one of them. I, I just don't do it. I started thinking about it this week. Like, when's the last time I went fishing? And I can think of the last two times I went fishing. Maybe somewhere in between, but I don't, I don't think so. Uh, the second, the, the two times ago was in 2003. Okay, that's just how bad it is, right? Uh, <laughs> we were doing a, a face painting event at a fishing event at Gray's Lake, and so I grabbed my youngest daughter's Barbie fishing pole and said, I'm, gonna, I'm a fisherman, I'm going to go fishing, and uh, caught me that monster. I, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't remember if we met, weighed that one, um, but uh, that was 2003, and, and I was pretty proud of that catch. And then 10 years later, the guys uh, at the church who went on a men's trip to Wyoming and did a bunch of hiking, a little bit of fishing. That's not even a picture of me. That, that, that <laughs> That's Jim Stocks. Because here's the deal. If you were to take a picture of me when we were out there fishing that day, you probably would have seen me with my phone up in the air because I was taking a picture of the scenery. Uh, uh, it, it, was, it was gorgeous out there. I think I have a picture of the scenery next. Uh, it, that's what I was looking at. Like, I didn't really care about the fish. I was looking around going, man, it's beautiful out here. And, and secretly, I was hoping I wouldn't catch a fish because it had been like 10 years since I caught that monster you saw. I, was, I don't even know if I can take the thing off the hook. I'd be like, Jim, <laughs> Jim, take my fish off the hook. So I was kind of hoping I wouldn't catch a fish. That, that's how much of a fisherman uh, I is. I is? I, I is good in English, too. <laughs> a lot of things I can do. English and fishing are not two of them. <laughs> uh, it's, how, it's how it works. Now, as you may know, some of the disciples of Jesus were fishermen, uh, not, not just casual fishers. I mean, they were like professional fishers. Right? I mean, they, 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 were, they were big time. This is what they did for a living. It was their business. It was their security. It fed their family. They would fish by night, go to the market and sell it by day. It was the business that they would get handed to them from their fathers to, to run. It would be the business that they would hand to their children later on for them to run. I mean, it, it was the center part of, of their life. 
As you read through the Bible, it describes several different types of fishing that took place. Uh, this one time, uh, Jesus tells Peter, uh, hey, hey, uh, catch a fish. We need to pay our taxes, right? That was probably a hook and, and line, kind of like what, what you probably maybe you do, uh, and I do so well. Um, um, uh, so it was, it was a single fish. There were uh, nets that were like really long that you would attach to two boats, and they would come to shore, and they'd bring a big pile in a really common one, and one that will probably is in, in the story we'll look at today, is a fish that was a round, a net that was a round net uh, at most 25 feet or so in, in diameter. Uh, it's not like you could just go out and buy these things at Walmart, right? Uh, so, so the part of the job of a professional fisherman was to make these nets and to maintain them and to keep, keep them going. Uh, they were made from linen. They had to be cleaned and dried out carefully every single day, or otherwise they would rot. Uh, be, and you don't want them to rot out soon because, or too early, because you, know, you have to hand make the next one. There were little stones that, that, that um, were used for weights that had been hand dried drilled little holes in it and weave woven into the net. Uh, this is obviously a modern one with, with, with probably not made quite that way. So we're probably thinking about a little, little thicker, probably netting because it was, it was hand woven uh, together. And because of the abuse of these nets, the, the professional fishermen spent a good portion of their time not only fishing, but also maintaining, cleaning, drying, making new nets. The job of fishing itself and the day was a pretty tiring job. They'd take these heavy nets, and of course it's linen, like I said, so wading down with water, plus it has the weights. They'd throw them out, and they'd let, let it sink down, and they'd pull it back up and into the boat. And if there's any fish in there, they'd pull that up into the boat, take the fish out, take out any whatever else is in there, um, take them out, maybe go to the other side, do it again. And all night long, they went back and forth casting these nets into the water, pulling them out, putting the fish in, in the boat, and and doing it, it again. It was pretty grueling work all night long for a fisherman in their day. Now, in Luke chapter 5, Jesus is teaching by the Sea of Galilee, and there's a couple of boats sitting by the lake where the fishermen had just recently gotten back in from fishing all night long. They, they, they dropped their nets in the water, they pulled them back all night long, one after another, two, two boats, both boats, all night long, going both crews, fishing all night long, not a single fish had been caught. I mean, it was a total fail. It, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a miserable time fishing. Zero fish. Because they are physically tired from being up all night fishing and catching nothing. They are emotionally drained because they, had, they made no money that night. So, so the, you know, you, that's, that's their living. They put all that time in and made zero. Uh, the entire night had been a, a waste of time. And, and they just kind of probably mentally, if you've ever done something like that, you just want to cut your losses and say, okay, whatever, it's what it is. Let's go home, get some sleep, we'll reboot, we'll come back tonight, hopefully have a better night tonight. That's probably the frame of mind that they are in. They're at the shore, they're cleaning the nets, they're drying out their nets, they're about ready to go home, they're about ready to get some rest, and Jesus walks up to the boat and jumps in one of them. They're like, oh, <laughs> we're getting ready to leave, and, and here's, here's this guy. Now, now, now they knew who Jesus, they, they've had rub shoulders with him a little bit, he was starting to gain in popularity, but Jesus jumps in the boat of a man named Simon, one of the fishermen, Simon, and he says, hey, push out into the water a little bit. i got to do some teaching. A crowd was following him, and he's really doing it for a couple of purposes. One, he needs some space from between him and the crowd, because uh, if you're right next to the per you know, you, you just can't see. The whole, the, and especially when they sit down when they teach, it'd be like the people in the back couldn't see, or, or nor could they hear. So he's getting a little bit of space between the crowd and, and Jesus. So they go out to shore a little bit, kind of like what we are here. And it's like, okay. And then, then he starts teaching and he continues doing what, what he was doing. So Jesus teaches for a while. Uh, Simon is no doubt finishing up that process of getting the nets cleaned up and ready to go. And when Jesus finishes teaching, he looks at Simon and he says, hey, why don't you go back into the deep and let down the nets? This is a great idea. <laughs> now, I don't know how you feel about someone who doesn't know your job, who isn't an expert in your job, coming up to you and telling you what to do. Uh, how would you respond to that? Uh, I mean, it'd be like, uh, thanks for the advice. No. no. Imagine, uh, uh, the, the closest I could think of was like a painter. Let's say you're painting all day, it's hot and grueling, and, and you got the spray around, you're doing, you, know, you do the whole thing, and, and you're done with the day, and you take this paint sprayer all apart, and you've cleaned all the pieces and all the parts, you put it away, it's all 
packed up, you got the, the little white thingy off, and, and you're ready to, like, you're cleaned up, you're ready to go home, you're like mentally done, you have checked out. And imagine the homeowner comes, hey, hey, there's a little part above the door, could you, could you go ahead and get that real quick before you go? You'd be like, uh, no, <laughs> thank you, uh, but no, I'm coming back tomorrow to finish the job, I'll do it then. And that's probably what Peter's thinking, we're coming back to fish tonight, We'll do it then. We got the nets pulled out. We got them cleaned up. We got, I mean, no. No, thank you very much, Mr. Non-Professional Jesus, you know, fisherman. Uh, I, thanks for your advice. I, I don't think so. And that's basically Simon's first response. Jesus says, hey, Simon, let's go cast out the net. Peter responds, I already tried it. Been doing it all night long. Two crews. No, thank you. It's not going to work. We'll just come back and fish tomorrow. Listen, listen to how Luke describes it in Luke chapter 5. On one occasion, this is verse 1. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him near the word, to hear the word of God, so the crowd wants to hear Jesus, right? He was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, this Sea Galilee, and, and he saw two boats, one by the lake, or by the lake, excuse me. But the fishermen had gone out of them, were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked them to, to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep, let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered him, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. No, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the offer. I am not interested. We already tried that. But look at the very next words out of his mouth. But. Like, it's almost like he was talking, and as he was talking, thinking, yeah, but it's Jesus. <laughs> all right? he, he has run in. But he had heard Jesus teach before. Matter of fact, he had healed Peter's mother-in-law at this point. So, so he, he already knew there was, knew there was something about Jesus. Right? So he says, we already tried that, Jesus. We already know it didn't work. But at your word, I will let down the nets. That's an impress that is impressive to me. That's impressive attitude right there. He starts off with, are you sure? I mean, you're not a fisherman like I am. I don't think you know what you're talking about. But he immediately corrects himself and says, at your word. Yes. Absolutely. If that's what you say, Jesus, uh, yeah. It gives us a little glimpse into the character uh, of, of Simon, uh, Peter, uh, who later is known as Peter, and, and uh, maybe gives you an idea of why Jesus would pick someone like Peter uh, to be one of his disciples and foundations of, of, of the future church. Uh, he was not yet an official disciple. Uh, he was just a regular working guy, a fisherman. And, and, and this, again, was the early stages of Jesus' ministry. Uh, disciples weren't picked yet. He was teaching. He was growing in popularity. Uh, teaching is spreading. He's casting out demons. He'd done miracles like, like Peter's mother-in-law. And so maybe Simon felt maybe a little bit obligated. Okay, you healed my mother-in-law. Uh, go ahead and hang out in my boat. I'll go ahead and listen to you once. I mean, maybe there was a little obligation there. Maybe he just understood, well, Jesus seems to have more power to his words than other people. I mean, I didn't tell my mother-in-law to heal, and she didn't get healed. I mean, that didn't work for me, but it did for Jesus. So there's something going on there. Who knows? But we do know Simon says, at your word, I will set down the nets. And look, look what happens in the next verse, verse 6. When he had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. Maybe Jesus knew something they didn't know. I don't know right, right? They singled, signaled excuse me, to their partners in the other boat and came, come to help him. And, and they come, came and filled the boat, both the boats excuse me, so that they both began to, to sink. See, uh, I, don't, I don't think Peter believed they were going to catch any fish. They left the other boat at shore. I, I, I mean, they were surprised. He, he was like, I'm just going to obey, but I don't think it's going to work. You ever do that with Jesus? I don't know if this is going to work, but that's what it says. Isn't that what we always say? If it says do it, do it. If it says don't do it, don't do it. And even though we think we're smarter than, than the Bible sometimes, it's like, I just trust it. Trust the Bible. Trust, trust God. He knows what he's talking about, uh, even though we don't. <laughs> and, and that's, 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 that's uh, kind of the case here. He's like, okay, I don't get it. I, I know it's not going to work, but I'll go ahead and do it. Because he is astonished at, at the fish that, that are caught. I think it's a perfect lesson uh, in doing things through the power of God, not through the power of man. How many times have we tried things on our own and it just doesn't work very well, but we try it with, uh, with God's direction and it works uh, superbly. Uh, it seems to work that way. There's a big difference between man's timing and God's timing and, and things. I guess this is one of the take-homes I see here is that God's timing always works better than our timing. 
Uh, that, that's why it's so critical we pray about things before we do things. That, 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 that's why we're having a 24-7 prayer room uh, this week, because we, want to, we just want to pray. Okay, God, we want to know, God, what do you want us to do? And we're not going to try to tell you what we want to do. What do, you, what, do you got, what do you got for us, God? You tell us when it's time to cast the net, and then we'll cast the net. You tell us when it's time to go fishing, we'll go fishing. You tell us, and we'll do. That, that, that's what this prayer room is all about. It, it's us seeking God's wisdom, seeking his, his, his guidance. That's why we're going to canvas the city this year in prayer walk. And, and that is being in the process of being organized right now. That we're gonna, every single family in this town is going to be prayed for uh, by Pathway. Hopefully other churches are doing it too. I don't know. But, but we're going to. We're going to. Because, because prayer is so powerful. Doing things God's way is so more uh, effective than doing things our way. That's why I, I, I would challenge you, if you haven't already, to start praying about who you're going to invite to church for Easter. Who is it? Uh, you might have your short list, but, but I'd throw that away and just start praying, okay, God, who do you want me to invite? Who do you want me to invite? Where should I cast my net? Peter and, and the others were casting their nets all night long, didn't catch a thing. Jesus, in one word, says, ah, go out there and do it again. The, 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 the boats are sinking. <laughs> I'd go his way. Go, go his way. So, so I would encourage you, I would challenge you to be praying right now. Who, who, who does God want you to, to invite? We try to reach Johnson through our power, through our wisdom, through our efforts. We're going to have empty boats. But in one, one moment, he could fill this place to overcapacity uh, with people who want to grow in a relationship with him. It's, it's up to him. So, so we pray. We pray. Look, look at Simon's response <clears throat> to Jesus. In verse 8, But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me. I'm a sinful man, O Lord. This wasn't about fish anymore. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. See, Peter realizes he was in the middle of a God moment right there. there was, God was doing something bigger than fish. God was doing something bigger than, than he understood, and he humbly bows before Jesus and calls him Lord. Okay, there's, you're, you're, something's happening here, right? And look who were in the boats with him, James, Peter, and John. Sound familiar? Kind of big names as you read through the Gospels, as you read through Acts and the rest of the New Testament. Those are pretty big names. Jesus completely changes their lives in this moment. He'd rub shoulders with them here and there. Like I said, he had taught, he had uh, healed Peter's mother-in-law. He, you know, he, he, they've heard him teach, but there was something this moment that changed their life, and they turned away from everything and started following him. He said, from now on, you will no longer fish for fish. You're going to start fishing for men. And they became lifelong disciples of Jesus that day, bringing people to Christ, making disciples of people, followers of Jesus who in turn brought other people to Christ and discipled them. Who in turn brought other people to Christ and discipled them. And you keep going down and down the list, generation after generation, to, to, to the point where you're here today because somebody at some point reached out to you, brought you to Jesus, you decided to follow him, and you're a disciple of his today. It traces back to the story. It traces back to God calling us to be fishers of men. See, this isn't just for Peter or Simon. It's for you. It's for us. It's for me. We're all called to be fishers of men. There's a change that takes place when we decide to follow Jesus, and we stop following our own selves and our own world and surround ourselves with our own stuff and our own pride and our egos. We stop following him, and we start doing his will, which is to fish for men. The Apostle Paul uh, talks about this important calling in Romans 10, and that's really what the, we're, we're basing this short little two-week series on, is, is the, this beautiful feat, if you saw the graphic. It comes out of Romans 10, verses 14 and 15. It says, how will they call on him who they have not believed? So you think about someone who, at work who's like, they, they just don't know Jesus, or you're a neighbor, or, or someone you know, you're like, man, I wish they just, why don't they just believe in Jesus? Well, he says right here why that is. How then will they call on him who they have not believed? How are they to believe in whom who they have not never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to, to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. 
We'll break the verse down a little bit next week because we'll talk about this a little bit more. But the progression is pretty simple. How can a person believe in Jesus if they don't even know who he is? There's a generation of people out there today in America who've never even gone to a church. I mean, they don't even know. It's no longer can we say, well, everybody knows Jesus. No, they don't. They do not know Jesus. There is a whole generation of people out there who do not know Jesus at all. How will they know? If, how can they believe if they don't know who he is? And how can they know who he is if nobody tells them? It's really simple logic. How can you possibly believe in what you've never heard of? And how will anyone tell them if no one sends them out? And how he says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Man, I hope my feet are beautiful. I hope that when I walk into work every day, I'm walking on beautiful feet that are carrying the message of Jesus. I hope that when I walk through my neighborhood, those are beautiful feet that are carrying me. Or when I walk into family reunions, wherever it is I go, whatever it is I do, that there are beautiful feet sending me on, on my way. Consider today, if you've never thought of it before, today, consider it your official marching orders. You're thinking, well, no one's ever sent me. Uh, you're being sent. You are sent. Consider yourself officially sent. Not by me. I don't have any authority. Not by Pathway Church. We have no authority. We're just, we're just a Jesus church, right? We're a Bible church. But by Jesus himself, who said, you follow me? Guess what? You're a disciple of me? Guess what? You're a fisher of men. You're no longer a fisher of fish. Oh, go ahead and catch fish too. That's okay. But you're a fisher of men. That's the highest priority in your world. So guess what? We're sending you out to pray in the weeks and months to come. We're sending you out to invite your friends to, to church. We're sending you out to invite your neighbors. I say to church. I'm saying to Jesus, right? We're sending you out to, to invite your co-workers to Jesus and to, and to church. We, we, we are not called to embrace our faith in Jesus and keep it to ourselves. Every one of us are called to be fishers of men. We do not have the luxury of sitting on this calling and just in, enjoying the message of the cross and, and, and the message of grace and, and keeping it to ourselves. It is for the rest of the world. Now, you might say, that's really great. I tried fishing before and I haven't really caught very much. Well, Simon kind of had that same thing going on, didn't he? Well, we tried all night long, didn't catch a thing. I asked someone, and they said no. Surely you've asked someone, right? And they probably said no. That's not time to quit. You ever have a bad day fishing? Do you have to quit? I mean, I quit fishing, but it wasn't because I wasn't catching fish. I got busy. We're, we're, we we, we kind of like, we'll invite someone and, and they'll say no. We're like, well, I guess I tried that. We go like decades because weeks become months, become years, become decades. And like, we, we just stop. Oh, I guess we're done. We tried once. No, 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 no. We are called continually to fish. This fish for men. So you have a bad night, you go out the next night. And you have a bad night, you go out the next night. You just can't keep casting those, those, not, those, those nets. Here's the deal. We all have different fishing holes. We all have our spots that, that are different than, than each other. I live in a neighborhood that you don't live in. You live in a neighborhood I don't live in. Those are different fishing holes. You work in a place I don't work. I work in a place you don't work. We have different fishing holes. Your child is on a sports team, mine's not on. That's a different fishing hole. You have so many different fishing holes that are part of your life. You rub shoulders with people who don't know Jesus pretty much every kind of day. So, so, so you know what? You don't have to use the same net every day. Use a different type of net. Use a different approach. Like I said, the Bible, sometimes they use a hook. Sometimes they use a round net. Sometimes they have a little long one. They had different names for them. It doesn't really matter. Uh, they use different approaches. We, 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 have, we have these nice little things. Here's a net. Hey, hey, let me tell you about this series coming up right here. Got a ton of these. You can, little mail cards. Put a stamp on it. Send it to someone. That's just a net. You know what? They might say, no, thanks. That's okay. You cast the net. <laughs> you know, that's not on you, how they answer. It's on you whether you tried. It's on you. You never catch a fish you never fish for, right? That's why I haven't caught any fish lately. I haven't been fishing. Uh, it's really simple. I'd probably catch more fish if I went fishing. Uh, that's just really simply uh, how, how it goes. I'll bet you there are at least five families in your world that you can invite to Jesus, especially as we're coming up towards Easter. When you know, it's, it's just a more natural time to do that. I bet if you were to sit down and make a... a so you could scribble on a napkin over lunch. Uh, okay, God, uh, write down work, write down neighborhood, family. People. <laughs> 
you know, waitresses, whatever, people that you rub shoulders with regularly, that you have some, at least kind of a, you know, and you start praying, God, where do you want me to cast my net? I'll bet you there's a, someone at work that he wants you to talk to that I would never reach. I could not only know, I'll never see him. I bet you there's someone in your family that he wants you to talk to. There is some friend of yours that you know, you have a relationship that I don't, that he wants you to talk to. You just start asking God, God, who do you want me? Who do you want me to fish for? And I'll bet you he'll give you an answer. Now, again, you might be thinking, I'm a lot of things, but I'm not a fisherman. (laughs) I don't do that. Well, maybe it's time to become one again. Maybe it's time to get those nets back in the boat, go back out to the deep end, and throw out that net and see what happens. See, this is how easy it is. Hey, where are you going to church for Easter? I don't blame you, Jesus. Okay. Go on. You don't have to walk away in shame. <laughs> oh, it didn't work. You, know, you go to the next person. Hey, where are you going to church on Easter? Oh, we go to church to blah, blah, blah. Great. Awesome. You go to the next person. Where do you go to church this Easter? I don't know. <laughs> little, you can be a little more slick than that. <laughs> you can tell, I mean, it's, it's not hard. I mean, I can't imagine anyone getting really offended by you saying, hey, where are you going to church for Easter? Even if they don't go, to say, oh, okay. You just don't club them after they say that. That's where we get a little crazy sometimes. You're, you're, you're casting nets. You're, 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 you're fishing. So you cast out 100 nets. You know what? You might think, what if only one responds? That one's going to be eternally grateful. <laughs> Isn't that worth it? Absolutely. Let me challenge you. You've got a couple weeks, and Easter's come. Now, don't stop when Easter's over. I mean, but that's just a natural time. That's the next big thing coming up. Start praying about it. But don't just pray about it. Go out and cast some nets.